All right, so we're staying with football here on the Sportsmax Zone. And CONCACAF is gearing up for the upcoming second round of World Cup 2026 qualifying. And as a preparation, Trinidad and Tobago hosted Guyana at the Hazley Crawford Stadium for two friendlies on Monday and Wednesday. The Soka Warriors won both matches, taking the first 2-1 and returning on Wednesday night to win 2-0. Let's hear now from both coaches. I think the opportunity was a fine one for the players in our league in Guyana uh, to get this exposure. Um, we gave away two gifts of a goal, but that in itself is a lesson for us that at this level of the game, the margin for error is very small. You get punished. Maybe in the league at home in Guyana, we may not have been punished for those errors, but it was good, a lesson for us in this game. Well, we, yeah. um, we're trying to make this um, stadium a fortress. We're trying to not lose games here. Um, if, we, if we do that in the World Cup campaign and beyond with, in the Nations League, we think that we'll get close to qualifying for the World Cup because that is the goal. That has been the goal since we came on board and the process has been ongoing and uh, we're happy in the position we are right now. In Sancho, 2006 Trinidad and Tobago World Cup defender, now football analyst, joins us to review the matches. Good afternoon, Brent. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you, Maria. And yourself? I'm doing well. So, two friendly matches. Were you present at the matches? Because I know you're a man who travels all around <laughs> the world. Were you in Trinidad? Yes, I was in Trinidad. I, I witnessed uh, the matches. Um, I think most and foremost, it was an exercise that uh, is uh, long overdue for many Caribbean countries. Uh, probably 10 years ago, uh, we'd have these sorts of fixtures outside of the international window, which would help in, in terms of the players uh, that don't necessarily get the game time during the international window, which really keeps your selection pool nice and tight. Uh, we've not had that for many reasons coming out of the pandemic. I believe one of them is, is of course, high airfare uh, for travel, uh, which has limited those sorts of games. So. First and foremost, the games and these sorts of games that we are seeing now is excellent for the development of those local players. So I think from that side of it, everybody won both Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. And it, the game itself, where I had several talking points coming out of it, and, and I think it was an important exercise for both coaches. Yeah, and one of the talking points I noticed, everyone, including yourself, spoke about the exposure of the players. Coach Jamal Shabazz spoke about that as well, spoke about the small margin for errors at this uh, level of football. Then Angus Eve going into the match, I think in the pre-match interview with you and of course Hans Devines, he was also speaking about giving other players the opportunity, exposing them to high-level football. So with that being said, what did you make of the opportunity that Enil got in goal for the Trinidad and Tobago Soka Warriors? And I think personally, he took that opportunity and he really made a mark. But I want to hear from you. Yeah, he was certainly one of uh, several talking points when it comes to team personnel. Of course, Denzel Smith being the number one goalkeeper for Trinidad uh, for quite a number of months and, and have done that admirably well. Uh, Enil, a, a player that has uh, really came to life in the last two to three months playing for Prison Services FC uh, in the TTPFL, have uh, had some man of the match performances and it's, has really stood out and he took that form into this game against Guyana where he made uh, what I would call a, a, a miracle save uh, in the second fixture and look really the path. He does look like he's capable of putting pressure on Denzel Smith, who is a first choice goalkeeper. And I think that is certainly uh, one of the talking points coming out of it. And of course, uh, the exploits of the 37 year old debutant Kevin Showtime Woodley, who scored in both fixtures Monday and Wednesday. Uh, and he's a type of forward that Trinidad Tobago have not had uh, in their purchase for quite some time. He is a forward that out and out knows where the goal is. His movements is excellent. Despite the fact being 37 years old, uh, he has certainly given uh, Coach Angus Eve something to think about. Right, and I think that's a good problem to have for any coach when you have different players stepping up, having two goalkeepers that are doing really well. That's not a problem at all, Brent, because for me in sport, you always need a good backup and there's nothing wrong in having a good backup. 
um, because of course injuries, anything can truly happen. Now in the at halftime, it was goalless, right? No goals after um, the first half. In the second half though, Trinidad and Tobago um, got to the back of the net twice. I'd like to hear from, you know, you were live and of course looking at the match in a different angle, different perspective among the vibes. What changed from the first half for the TNT Soka Warriors and also for Guyana, the Golden Jaguars, versus the second half? I think we are a lot more clinical, first of all, foremost, because there were opportunities for both teams in, in the first half that they weren't able to, of course, take. Uh, and in the second half, I think the, the substitutions, again, going back to Kevin Showtime Woodley, his movement started to open up Guyana a bit more uh, as a forward. Uh, his, 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 his goal scoring ability, of course, scoring one out of the two goals uh, and pressing a little bit higher up the park. And I think the combination of that and the midfield uh, shift as well, change things a bit for Trinidad Tobago. It's interesting to note because a lot of people here in Trinidad Tobago believes that uh, this team should be playing, quote-unquote, more front foot football, yeah. uh, more attacking type football. Uh, but what I drew from both games is that when we do play that way, we do leave ourselves quite open at the back, as I have, I've always mentioned when I talk about Trinidad and Tobago. We did play front foot football, but we did give Guyana a lot of opportunities on goal. And if they were a little bit more clinical, both games probably would have ended up in a tie. Yeah, Brent, at the end of the first game, Angus Eve said he was disappointed, especially with the second half performance, because he felt that a lot of the things that they had practiced um, was, was not seen in that performance. Do you believe that after game two, he would be slightly happier with the performance of this TNT team? I think he would be satisfied. I don't think necessarily he would be overly joyed with what transpired. Again, I go back to the fact that a lot of people have been clamoring for Trinidad Tobago to not be as defensive as, as we played against the likes of Canada and even when we played in the Gold Cup. Uh, but one thing, again, if you looked at the way we, we applied ourselves, we did have three of our better ball handlers, local ball handlers, in the middle of the park in Goddard, Punanjanon and Mocket, and we still weren't able to break down a, a very well-organized Guyanese team in, in any fashion. What it also led to, Ricardo, was chances and transition, because once the ball was coughed up, we were left very, very exposed. And on a couple of occasions, Guyana did carve Trinidad Tobago apart and, and did present themselves with opportunities. So from a tactical perspective, uh, the, a lot of the, the, well, the quote-unquote critics who have been clamoring for a more offensive approach from Coach Anglesey will have to take stock at what transpired over those two games because Guyana did have their chances. Yeah, when you look at both teams and with World Cup qualifying action coming up shortly, of course, Guyana will play Panama on the 6th of June and Trinidad and Tobago will take on Grenada on the 5th of June. Um, how many of the players that took part in these two friendly matches are you expecting to see in the respective squads when World Cup qualifying starts? Well, I think from the Guyanese perspective, they had at least six players that uh, played in the Nations League uh, group that saw them go undefeated and then, of course, promoted to, 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 to League A. Uh, I expect that uh, six persons or so and maybe uh, uh, an additional forward added to that. So maybe seven players may join that. I think from a Trinidad and Tobago perspective, it's an interesting one uh, because there are competition for spots in the central half the, uh, position. Uh, which we saw uh, Bato coming back from Belgium, Sheldon Bato, that is. We saw uh, uh, Josiah Tringham coming back from his league play in Jamaica, all playing in this fixture, as well as, of course, a notable standout in Justin Garcia. That is certainly a position that's up for grabs, so there may be one or two new persons coming into there. There is at the wing-back position, where I thought Isaiah Garcia did himself uh, good credit, as well as uh, uh, Ross Russell Jr. in the first game. And of course, all conversations have led to Kevin Showtime Woodley, the player at 37 years old, making his debut scoring at both games uh, so far uh, and showing definitely that he has the capabilities of possibly uh, breaking into the squad. Um, and I think those are the sorts of situations and storyline. And going back to the question of the goalkeeper, I think uh, Enel may have a, a question mark over uh, whether or not he can get in there because he's done well as well. So I think there are a couple of players that have done themselves well and maybe knocking on Angus Eve's door for his final selection against Grenada. Yeah, we'll definitely see how that goes. And you know, Brent, you brought up the point earlier um, about the way the Soka Warriors play and that there are many individuals who feel that they should be playing more on the front foot. Now, 
that is not uncommon for Caribbean fans to feel that way about their national team. But I'll ask this question, does Trinidad and Tobago at this time have the quality, um, both in terms of, well, especially what they have in midfield and at the back, to play that type of football where they can potentially be exposed, especially against the best teams in CONCACAF? No, I don't think so. And, and when you talk about quality, I would point strictly to personnel because, of course, uh, within the middle of the park, I don't think we have the type of midfielders that are, are, are very good on the ball and can play in tight spaces. I don't think we have the type of defenders that are comfortable in the football to bring the ball and break through uh, pressing lines. Uh, and I think from a transitional point of view, I don't think we have the athleticism in the middle of the park to recover when we do lose the football. And, and those three points was very evident in the both games, albeit, of course, some may argue that some of the players or a lot of the players may not partake in the game against Grenada. But it's indicative of what type of personnel we have in Trinidad and Tobago when it comes to our squad. Uh, and we have to understand, and I think Coach Angus is fully understand that, that we have to, to play a particular way with the type of personnel that we have. And, and until we understand that and get very good at that situation, uh, playing on the front foot is something of, of more or less a dream for, for most fans. Yeah, and let's stick to the Trinidad and Tobago conversation because a lot has happened with the Trinidad and Tobago's football over the last year. We know as well that there is a new administration in place and um, so we wait to see uh, what differences that will lead to for Trinidad and Tobago's football. Um, but I want to get an understanding from you as to how you think Coach Angus Eve is feeling heading into World Cup qualifying. I suspect he'll feel that Trinidad and Tobago's football is in a better place than it was a year ago when they were trying to qualify for the Gold Cup and even after qualifying when they got to the Gold Cup. Yeah, Coach Angus Eve has had, of course, his tenure extended. It goes up until March next year. He, he has had this team for quite some time. He has had his fair share of criticism in the way he has approached games. But I think he is comfortable in his skin. And I think the players are also comfortable as to the way he wants to play. And I think that's sometimes, Ricardo, the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about international senior football, you talk about results. It is a result-based business. Uh, and so far, Coach Angus, he may feel that he would have gotten his fair share of good results. He sat, sat on the right side of good results. Now this is the real test. He's in a group that I think is, is still have its difficulties because I do believe that Grenada will possess a threat for Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, we're fortunate that we are hosting them here in Trinidad and Tobago. But overall, this is really the litmus test because for everything that has transpired in the past, it really is about trying to qualify for a World Cup. And Trinidad needs to find itself in the top two uh, alongside possibly Costa Rica coming out of the group. But as I said, I do feel there are certain bumps along the way that Trinidad and Tobago has to be wary of. And of course, there's Nations League to come in September as well. So I do feel there is a cadre of games that uh, Coach Angus he still have to navigate uh, to make sure that his tenure is secure. Yeah, and talking about that group, Brent, Grenada there, Bahamas there, St. Kitts and Nevis, and as you pointed out, Costa Rica, I suspect that Trinidad and Tobago will feel relatively confident this is a group they should qualify from. There is a certain level of confidence, but certainly if uh, history is to teach us anything, of course, it's a Trinidad and Tobago team that had a draw against bah Bahamas uh, not too long ago, albeit, of course, it was under a different coach. Uh, and, of course, we've had our struggles against Grenada, a team that normally shows up when it plays against Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not it, as much as it may be painted uh, as a straightforward situation. I think Trinidad has to be in its P's and Q's, and particularly because we haven't been scoring goals and we haven't been... Uh, of course, uh, very rampant in our display. We've had our defeats. We've had a he hefty defeat against Curacao that exposed us badly uh, as it relates to our defensive frailties. And we had our, we've had our, our challenges. Of course, the, the, this game against Grenada uh, that's coming up uh, will give us that early challenge that possibly could determine how this group goes because a, a result for Grenada, whether it be a draw or a win, would certainly put, uh, the, the, uh, certainly put Trinidad and Tobago in a very, very dangerous spot. Uh, but there is enough confidence within the camp, I think, within the new executive as it relates to the conversation of, of World Cup qualification and a belief that Trinidad and Tobago can possibly go all the way. Yeah, and on to Guyana now, as we look at that group with Panama, there's Belize, there's Nicaragua, and there's 
Montserrat in that group as well. Um, how much of a shot do you give them of making progress? It's a tough group, uh, certainly for Guyana. But one thing uh, you have to note with Guyana is that they have recruited quite well. Uh, yeah. When it looks, when you look at the type of players from the diaspora that they've been, they've been able to choose from, uh, just looking at their performances in the Nation League Group B, uh, going through undefeated and what I thought was a relatively difficult group, shows you that they do have uh, the capabilities of course in one or two uh, big results. And uh, they have been actively recruiting. There have been a lot of reports of uh, new players coming into the camp. And I'm quite sure that uh, they would feel that uh, with those players coming in, added to what they already have, uh, that they can create an upset or two. Uh, we've seen this throughout the Caribbean uh, as it relates to that, uh, recruiting from the diaspora. Grenada is very similar as well. So the Guyanese may feel that um, charging forward with those uh, new charges that they have recruited can give them a chance. Albeit, of course, as I mentioned, it is a very difficult group. Yeah, very much the case. Uh, well, Brent, thank you so much. It is going to be quite a summer, you know, because um, <laughs> right across sports, you're talking about the IPL is going to finish soon and then the Cricket World Cup, the T20 World Cup will begin. You're talking about World Cup qualifying in football. There's the Euros this summer. And, of course, the Olympic Games will be this summer as well from Paris, mm -hmm. France. If you're a lover of sport, this is <laughs> your summer. I Certainly wonder. is. <laughs> yeah, Mariah um, is going to be at a lot of those events. I know Brent travels a lot. He'll spend a night in Paris and then be in Trinidad the next day. But it was great chatting to you, Brent. We'll chat again soon. Certainly, guys. Have a great one. Yeah, Mariah, you're that type of traveler, right? You probably have, like, frequent miles and those things. I do have a lot of miles, but it's not because of work. I never said what it was because of. I do travel a lot, if, if that's what you're asking. Oh. Anything else you'd like to know before we take the viewers to a break? No, not on air. Let's All right. go to what the What I track. do want to tell them, though, is we're heading across to at the track when we return. So look forward to that.